All right, so everyone open up to Shemot chapter 38, verse 21. Exodus 38 and verse 21. Bless Hashem, the Blessed One. Blessed is Hashem, the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all peoples and gave us His Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. And everybody said amen. This week's Torah portion is Pekudei, or as the kids say, Pekudi, just because... It sounds funny to them, I guess. Uh, Pekudei is the Hebrew word. We see it in the uh, third or fourth word there, uh, depending on what your translation, how it reads. And it is the uh, Hebrew word for uh, the amounts of, or the accounting of, or the sum of. You have a lot of different ways that, that your translations translate it. Um, and uh, it, this is the uh, last Parsha in the book of Shemot. So we have made it through Bereshit and through Shemot and this is a, a summary sort of, of what we've read already and the actual setting up of the Mishkan um, this Parsha has over 4400 Hebrew letters 1182 words 92 verses and 159 lines on a Torah scroll and I just love stuff like that um, and so uh, this is a, a, a shorter Portia than the last few we've had, but uh, a couple things that I want to speak to. So let's begin in chapter uh, 38 in verse 21. It says, and these are the reckonings or the countings or the sum. What else do you have in your, in your translation? What else do you see? Amounts, inventory, yeah, yeah. All, so which one is right? And the answer is yes. Um, this is a, a, an inventory, an amount, accounting. Uh, that word is uh, pekudei. The word uh, pekudei occurs the first time in Scripture when the Lord visits Sarah after the promise of Yitzhak. And it said the Lord visited the Lord showed up, the Lord came. That word is pekad, the root word of pekude. Now, how does that fit? Why would the Lord pekad Sarah when he had already given the promise that she would bear the promised child, the son of the covenant? What may not make a whole, whole lot of sense when you just look at Avram and Sarah. But the next place that this word pakad shows up is in the story of Yosef. Okay? We know that Yosef was taken into Egypt, right? And he was set as the chief servant, right? He was set as, and what was his job? His job was to oversee. That's the word pakad. Okay? His work, his, he was to oversee all of Pharaoh's dealings, to look to make sure that things were going on the way that the king had commanded. So that's the second time we see that word. Then we see Yosef being thrown into prison, and the captain of the guard set him up as overseer over the prison, Pakad. And then we see Yosef being brought to Pharaoh, and and Yosef tells Pharaoh, you need to set up an overseer over the gathering of the grain for the famine. You need to set up a pakad, an overseer. So now let's go back to Avram and Sarah. Why does Hashem show up? Why does he pakad when he says you're going to give birth to a son? And he's going to be the promised one, the son of the covenant. He shows up, he shows up to oversee, to make sure that Avram has done, Avram and Sarah have done what Avram and Sarah were supposed to do. This is the idea of, um, of a manager. 
your boss at work or your, you know, the, 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 the top of your division or whatever sets about a, a team goal and says this month, this week, we need to have this done. And then he goes back up to his office. And then periodically he will come by and just check on things, make sure things are going well, make sure things are going right. Some of you are teachers in here. You have observers that come by, right? That's peku day. They're, they're, they're pekading. Not really, but that's, that's the, they're overseeing to make sure that things are happening the way they are supposed to. So not only is this just a physical counting, Moses is not standing there with a, a checklist, an inventory list only, and just checking things off. He is actively overseeing all these different parts of the Mishkan that are happening. So let's read on. It says, these are the reckonings of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, which were reckoned at Moses' bidding. The labor of the Levites was under her, of the tribe of Yehuda. I'm sorry, it was under the authority of Itamar, son of Aaron the Kohen. I skipped a line, apologize. 22, Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, did everything that Hashem commanded Moses. With him was Aholiab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, a carver, weaver, and embroiderer with turquoise, purple, and scarlet wool, and with linen. All the gold, that's a key word, that was used for the work, for the holy work, the offered up gold was 29 talents and 730 shekels in the sacred shekel. So, Moshe is actively overseeing the inventory of the Mishkan. We see that we have three people listed here. The first being Ismar, the son of Aaron. Now, Bible trivia, how many sons did Aaron have? Huh? Four. Very good. Miss Janice wins. Nothing, but you still win. Four sons. What were their names? Eliezer, Nadab, Abihu, right? And Ismar. Ismar is the youngest of the sons. Quite possibly a teenager. Or late late teens is what, what we think. So he seems to be at this point kind of Moshe's right hand man now later on we'll find that Moshe has another that he's mentoring whose name is Yehoshua another young man possibly teenager late teens right scholars also believe or sages also believe that Bezalel and Aholiab were maybe young 20s when they began when the spirit of God filled them and they began to do this work and I think that's an amazingly beautiful picture of Moshe and how God ordained for the work of the kingdom to be done. Moshe could have said, like is my tendency and is like is many, many people's tendency, this is a serious deal. What, it, what does the Mishkan represent? Remember we've talked about it the last month or so. The Mishkan, the temple, represents the place where heaven and earth connect. That's pretty serious business. I would venture to say there's no more serious business maybe at this time than making sure that this thing is right. Exactly like the Tavnit that Moshe was seeing on Mount Sinai. And yet, he doesn't say, listen, I'm the one who saw the pattern. I'm the one that makes all the calls. I'm the one that has to make sure it's my responsibility. See, in leadership, and, and maybe not even leadership, but maybe even your own family, are you the one that carries the weight of your entire family? Are you the one, do you believe in your heart, and I'm not criticizing, I'm, I'm serious, do you believe in your heart that if you were to fall down for a couple of days that your entire family would fall apart? Some of you carry that every single day, every moment of the day of your life. I can't get sick, I can't stop, I can't be out, I can't take a break, because if I stop, everything's going to fall apart. Moshe could have very, very legitimately had that kind of attitude. If I am not involved and my hands are not involved in every single piece of this sacred thing, then it's all, it's, it, God's not going to bless it. And yet he didn't. Why? Because the world doesn't revolve around Moshe. And newsflash, 
the world doesn't revolve around you and it doesn't revolve around me but I want it to because that means that I'm needed and I have a purpose and I, and I have a, a, a meaning but it doesn't Moshe understood the value of letting other people younger people be teachable be involved in the process there's a statement that I heard a long time ago that said that everybody is an expert at something Everybody is an expert at something. Sadly, some people are experts at being jerks. But even in that expertise, I believe there's a gifting there that has been misused. You know the person that will say what nobody else is thinking? That's a gift. It's not always used correctly. You know, children that get in trouble in school for, because they can never shut up, it might not be ADHD, and you might, need to pump, might not need to pump them full of medication. It may be that their gifting is speaking, and it might not be being trained at home. starts at home. And so Moshe understood the, the value of having these possibly younger boys involved in the process. And of course, we'll read about uh, Aaron's other sons later on in the, the Parsha because a lot goes on there. So verse 24 says, talks about the inventory or the weight of the gold. Now, they're building a sacred building, a sacred space. And um, I made the statement before service began, an article I read last week. The title of the article was, The Tabernacle is... Mashiach. The tabernacle is Mashiach. How can you say that? What does that mean? Well, in the last Parsha, we see that all of the, uh, the altar, all of the implements, all of the elements of the temple, something very special happened to them in the last Parsha. Does anybody remember what that was? They were what? Anointed. They were anointed. What is the Hebrew word for anoint? To anoint, it's mashach. To anoint is mashach. So in very real sense, the, temp, the tabernacle is mashiach. It's the place where we draw near to God. I'll just leave that there. You can kind of think about it this week. Given that this is such an important project and that this is such a sacred job, Verse 24 says all the gold. We've got to stop right there because let's be honest. The B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, do not have a super great track record when it comes to dealing with gold. Right? They, they can't necessarily be trusted. Are you putting it together now? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? All right. Cannot necessarily be trusted when it comes to fashioning gold, i.e. the golden calf. Wake up, everybody. All right. So Moshe and Aholiav and uh, Bezalel and Isamar are overseeing. They are subcontractors, if you will, in this job of doing all of these things. Because the last time Moshe left the people alone, a golden calf appeared out of the fire. This time, Moshe's not going anywhere. He's not, mm -mm, nope. He may not, his hands may not be involved in every single job, but he is there walking around making sure he's Picard, okay? He's overseeing. He's doing what needs to be done. Here's a question that I have. I, I wasn't here, uh, or we didn't cover it last week, uh, and, and Kyle covered the golden calf before, the week before. But just something I like to point out every, week, every time I, I can is that, we need to make sure that we're thinking about the Israelites in the correct way. If you're, if you're of a, per, a certain persuasion or if you grew up a certain way maybe, the temptation is to think of the Israelites in the wilderness as these kind of like knuckle-dragging Neanderthals, right? That They're kind of like caveman-ish. And not just the Israelites, but all of the people of this time period, you know, that they're, they're, they're ignorant and they're, you know, not really sure how the world works and, and they're primitive and all of these different things. But we found out in the last couple of Parshas that, that 
Bezalel and Aholiab, they took gold, okay? They hammered it thin into a sheet, okay? Which is not a real big deal. Gold's soft. It's a, it's a malleable metal. It can be worked even really kind of without too much heat. But it doesn't stop there. What did they do with it after that? They made thread. If they were so primitive, let me see you make some thread out of a sheet of gold. <laughs> if, if we're so smart, let's have a gold thread making class this week. And we'll see how we do. They made thread out of sheets of gold. That's unbelievable. I don't even know how you do that. Anyway, carefully. <laughs> That's so good. So, okay. So, uh, verse, 29, uh, verse 25, I'm sorry. And the silver of the census of the community was 100 talents, uh, 1,775 shekels in the sacred shekel. A, a becca for every head, a half shekel in the sacred shekel for everyone who passed through the census takers. Remember, that was commanded a partial ago, a couple partials ago. From 20 years of age and up for the 603,550. This is commonly today referred to as the temple tax, the half shekel. The hundred talents of silver were cast in the sockets of the sanctuary and the sockets of the partition, and a hundred sockets for the hundred talents, talent, and, and from the thousand, uh, and then we have copper in verse 29. I'm not going to read all those intricate, uh, intricate details, uh, but we have this idea of sockets or hooks. That is what letter? We talked about it last week. Anybody remember? Vav, the letter Vav in uh, our English, English language. Uh, it can be translated as and if it's at the beginning of the word. Uh, Vayakel, and he assembled, or and they assembled, Vayakel. Um, we have uh, the book Vayikra, that, that, that's and. Um, and you see it, uh, I talked about it last week, in a Torah scroll or in the text. You see Vav at the beginning of the line of text. And it's like almost every line, save just a couple. And, 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 and. So the letter Vav is the connecting. It's the, it's the ring. It's the socket. It's the tent peg. It's the connector that connects all of this stuff together. Um, and then verse 39, like I said, we're not going to read all the gory details. Uh, at verse uh, chapter 39 begins uh, Aaron's vestment, and we talk about the ephod again. We talk about the breastplate. Uh, we talk about the robe, which was uh, made of uh, techelet. And uh, the tunics, the white linen tunics. Uh, and then in verse 33, it says they brought, uh, uh, verse 32 actually, let's start there. And uh, the work of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was completed. And the children of Israel had done everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, so did they do. It is popular and it is some some reason there's some sort of bent for us to recreate the physical tabernacle there's models all over Israel there's full scale models there's models all over America we want to recreate this this tabernacle there's a there's a need and a desire for us too. And I'm not knocking it. I think it's a great teaching tool and it, it helps bring it to life so we can understand. And as long as that's what its purpose is, I, I think it's a beautiful thing. But why do you think we have such a desire to recreate the Mishkan? Does anybody have any ideas or input as to why you think that is? Yeah, because I think we have a desire in our bones to connect to heaven. We... We need that connection. And the purpose of the temple is, so God, what is the reason that God told Israel to build the Mishkan? Vishikanti, right? That I may dwell, and I will dwell. Vishikanti, I will shikanti. Oh, that word shikanti. That word shekinah. We saw the shekinah today in service. No. No, you didn't. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you didn't. You know, the word um, Shekinah is, is, is um, man, it's, a, it's kind of a toughie. 
because it kind of deals with an abstract idea. How do you know if someone or something is present or dwells? How do you know unless there is a physical manifestation? We easily and mistakenly say, well, I felt it. Oh, well, that's a problem because emotions are about as trustworthy as, well, I'm not going to say, but I wish emotions were as trustworthy as some of the spandex I see at Walmart, but, but they're not. And so when we interact with God, I believe that God uses our emotions I do believe that he can use our emotions, but when we are led by emotions, we're starting off at a disadvantage. And so do I believe that, that God dwells and, and, and God is there when people are gathered together? Absolutely. Absolutely I do. But sh Shekinah and, and the, the, the idea of, of God's people being together and, and the Spirit of God being present really are two different things and that'll be another series that'll come somewhere down the line because don't take a deep breath yet because I'm not done because the Shekinah the cloud as we'll read at the end of this Parsha did not fall until everything was in place and everyone was in place And Hashem's presence, in order to approach, there is a protocol. That's what the Mishkan teaches us. It teaches about the protocol of how to approach a holy God that we can't even comprehend. All right, let's keep going. So all the work of the tabernacle and the children of Israel had done everything that Hashem commanded Moses, so they did. Can we say that about ourselves? Not about building the physical Mishkan, but can we say that, that we're doing everything that Hashem has commanded us to do? Can, we, can you say that? Can you look in the mirror and say that? Can we look in the mirror as a ministry and say that we're doing everything that Hashem has commanded us to do? The answer is no, we can't. Can we do much, much, much better? Absolutely. When that happens, what is the effect of that? The effect of that is that the kingdom is brought down to earth. That's the effect of doing everything that Hashem wants us to do. Verse 33, so, Mo, so they brought the tabernacle to Moshe, the tent and its all its utensils, its hooks and planks and bars and pillars and sockets, the cover of red dyed ram hides and the cover of tahash skins, the partition curtain, the ark of the testimony and staves, the cover, the table, and all its utensils, the, the uh, uh, lechem habanim, the showbread, uh, the menorah and its lamps, its lamps, the prescribed order, and its utensils, the oil illumination, the golden altar, the anointing oil, the incense spices, uh, the petition for the entrance of the tent, the copper altar, and the copper meshwork, and its staves, utensils, laver, the curtains, all of these things is giving the inventory, the knitted vestments for Aaron, the Kohen, and the vestments for his sons. Verse 42, like everything Hashem commanded Moshe, so did the children of Israel perform all the labor. I got to stop here again. <sighs> You know this, but you we, we all we know this, but we all need to be reminded that being covenanted with God, coming through Messiah and being born again, being brought near, being in the kingdom, being recreated, is not the end. It is not the only thing that happens. It is just merely the beginning. Remember, it's not about what we're saved from as much as it's what we are saved for. This, I'm gripping my teeth, I'm sorry. This easy believism, simple, lazy, greasy grace gospel that you can come in and be saved and then sit on your spiritual backside and Jesus take the wheel is wrong it's destructive because the people were brought out of Egypt and they did what they got to work building 
the Mishkan. They got to work bringing heaven to earth as it is in heaven. May it be on earth. They got busy tikkun olam, bringing heaven down. They did everything. Verse 17 tells us that it was in the first month, the, the first month of the second year, on the first of the month, that the tabernacle was erected. That would be Aviv 1, Nisan 1, depending on what calendar you use. Moshe erected the tabernacle and put down its sockets. He spread the tent over. I'm just giving through the verses. He uh, placed the ark and the staves, and he put the table, and he placed, and he placed, and he placed, and it says over and over, he put, he placed, he placed. Moshe did. In verse 34, this is the, <laughs> this is day seven of the day of, cre of the week of creation is verse 34. You remember, you remember, um, sorry. God orders creation, creates for six days, right? It's funny, over the last couple of weeks, how many times I've seen a reference to the six days of creation. I see it everywhere all of a sudden. I don't know if more people are writing about it or if I'm just... You know, when you find a vehicle you like and you, you're thinking about maybe that could be your next vehicle, you see them everywhere. Like, did everybody just buy this vehicle? Because I wanted it. The six days of creation. Folks, there are not six days of creation. Stop it. There are seven days. Six days are the, the they're not even the point. Day seven is the point. We have all of this time of them fashioning these these gold rods and these hooks and these this table and these altars and the laver and these curtains and the, they're fashioning they're creating not materially creating they're administrating they're putting all of these things together and then Moshe takes some time I believe it was six days that Moshe takes to put up the tabernacle and put everything in its place. And then what happens on the seventh day of creation? God took a nap. No. God rested. Order had come to creation. What happens when Moshe gets all of the tabernacle ordered and set in place and everything set up. What happens in verse 34? The cloud descends. This is the set. Hashem is taking his place on the throne. The Mishkan is completed. Order has come to the camp of Israel. The king is on his throne. That's why one of the reasons why Shabbat is so important. This is the day that order comes, that we learn about what true order really means. The cloud covered the tent in verse 34, and the glory, the kavod of Hashem filled the tabernacle. That word glory, kavod, is not like glory. It's not that kind of glory. The word kavod means heaviness, means weight. <laughs> this is so funny. Y'all are not going to find this funny, but I laughed my took us off last night. There's an app now. You know how when you, when you watch in some gospel churches, how, you know, the preacher uh, gets anointed, anointed and, and starts to kind of sing his message, you know, a little bit. He gets into that, that flow, and then the band is like, you know, making like the stabs, uh, uh, you know, the organist is, all this kind of stuff. Listen, there's an app now <laughs> that comes with those things pre-recorded. So the preacher cannot have a band at all and be, st I'm going to get it. I'm going to do it once you're bought. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Watch me. Tell me I'm not. And I'm gonna, but you can be up and you can be preaching and not have a soul in behind an instrument, and you can have your own shout music going on. Well, it's awesome. I'm gonna do it. I can't wait. It's gonna be phenomenal. The glory, the glory fell. The weight. Could it be that 
when this cloud descended, this tabernacle was completed, all the things were in its place, that when the, the weight fell, that it was a, a physical cloud, but all of a sudden, everyone stood back and went, whoa. Could it have been at that point that they realized exactly what they had been called for? And maybe that is the weight as much as it is the presence of God. How the presence of God affects you is what Kavod speaks to more than the presence itself. How it affects you, what it, how it challenges you, how the Spirit of God puts responsibility on you. We can shout and sing and raise our hands and sway and cry and fall out. We can do all of that all we want, and it does not matter if it does not affect what we do. All of the old sayings that going to church doesn't make you, you know, Christian like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger, and all the, all the stuff we say, and, and, and yet we, we want to get in the presence so bad, so bad, but yet does it affect, do we feel that glory, do we leave feeling that glory not like, wow, that was heavy, dude, or do we feel it like, I'm responsible now for what I just encountered, I'm responsible for what I just encountered. Kavod is the same kavod that Abraham felt when God said, um, through you, all of the nations of the earth will bless themselves. Who, me? Imagine, Scott, if God said, through you, all of the nations of the earth are gonna bless themselves. My first answer would be, let me pray about it. No. The weight of, so the experience of God is not about getting a high. It's not about getting, getting some, kind of, some kind of, you know, tingle and zing down your spine. It's, it's not about that. It's about the, the weight of responsibility. I have the responsibility to give this gift to the world around me. Verse 36, And the cloud was raised up from the tabernacle. The children of Israel would embark on all their journeys. If the cloud did not raise up, they would not embark until the day it rose. For the cloud of Hashem would be on the tabernacle by day, and fire would be on it at night before the eyes of all of the house of Israel throughout their journeys. They moved as the cloud moved because you remember what Moshe prayed. He said, If your presence does, if you don't go with us, we're not going. If you don't go with us, I'm not going. At the end of each book of the Torah, we get to that. It's uh, customary to read, uh, to say three Hebrew words. Chazak, Hazak, Vanis, Hazek. Can you say that? Chazak, Hazak, Vanis, Hazek. That means be strong, be strong, and may you be strengthened. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and implanted eternal life within us. Blessed are you,